Actually, we start with a story. In the summer of 1996, I was 19 years old, and my friends and I decided that we were going to start a business where we were going to put menus on the internet for college students like ourselves who often lo lost the menus that we had in our dorm rooms. And we went around to Boston's, I was, I'm from Boston, we went around to a lot, a lot of um, restaurants in Boston and said we're going to charge them $10 a month to put their menus on the internet. And we sold about 500 restaurants in the course of like, you know, two or three months. And boy, were we pretty psyched about that. We were like solving this problem for ourselves, for our peers. It was just one small problem. None of my friends and I knew how to make a website. And we had all these people paying us and we had to figure it out really, really quickly. And the reason I tell this story is that I think of that that summer is really the beginning of my journey in the world of product, in the world of user experience, in the world of design. And the first thing I think of when it comes to these kind of things that we do, at least the way I approach things, is about problem solving. So my first step in the world of user experience was not about designing, it wasn't about you know, building things, it was about solving a problem and figuring out how to implement that. And we did actually eventually learn how to make a website and, uh, and, and learned HTML and everything. But the first thing was, what can we do with this technology? So I wanna start there because we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of tell you a few anecdotes about my own career over the course of this, uh, this talk. Um, and I wanna tell you that, like, that, that my fortune to, to have been working with a lot of these kind of bigger companies over the years, as well as helping to launch startups has taught me so much about how to approach people, how to approach uh, uh, problem solving, how to approach technology, and how to collaborate with a variety of people. And I get to talk to a lot of those people on my podcast, which is called Story in the Bottle, which uh, is where I basically get um, founders and VCs and other technologists really, really drunk and get them to tell me about their, their life story. Because that's what we're talking about. User experience, product, it's all about storytelling. And you know, this, this talk could be called finding your business voice, not your UX voice. I think a lot of the things we'll go over are actually about how we all adapt and evolve ourselves over time. And for me, when it comes to user experience, I like to think of the idea that like, this has been something that's been going on in the world for a lot longer than the internet's existed. People have been creating experiences since way, you know, 4,000 BC, probably even before that, right? And, and every time a new technology exists or a new innovator kind of comes up with an idea, it generally is tied to how am I evolving the experience of the world? And I like to think about this because I think how we got to now is a really good way of, of kind of creating the foundation for our own voices. So as we say, like experience has been created for a long, long time. The reality is that user experience has actually been everywhere for a long time as well. And when th thinking about user experience, I always like to think that it's one of the things that gets ignored a lot in, in product design. It's a very catchy phrase right now, but I remember when I first started uh, professionally doing user experience, you'd have a lot of people coming in and be like, well, we don't need the user, ex user experience person or the information architecture person, we just need a designer and a developer. And I think a lot of things, a lot of mistakes that were made on the internet were because of the fact that user experience was not appreciated for what it really brings to the table. And I'm a big fan of not reading from my slides, so feel free to, feel free to read while I, I, I talk, talk around them. But what I learned coming into information architecture and user experience, and really product, is that when you think about why you're creating that experience, think about who you're creating it for, you can really change a business. When user experience is done right and communicated right, it can totally flip something that was going totally wrong to totally right. I'll give you an example of this. Um, about 10 years ago, there was a company called Backstage. And Backstage has been a print publication for 50, 60 years. And Backstage had a problem. It had an internet, uh, sorry, it had a website that was probably the most ugly, useless website in the history of the internet. And they hired us to redesign it. And basically they're like, we're gonna reskin it. You know, you have articles about how to get an agent. It's, a, it's like a business uh, to business publication for actors and casting directors. So how to get an agent, how to audition, how to find parts and whatever. But the print magazine's real revenue always came from the 
back of the back of the book classifieds. You know, here's an audition, here's an audition, here's an audition. So we went out and did some research. And I'm a big fan of research. I love talking to users, understanding what their motivations are. And we learned in, in the course of talking to users that no one wanted to read these articles about how to, you know, how to audition, how to find an audition, how to dissect a monologue or whatever. All they wanted to do was find a job. And then we started talking to casting directors. And casting directors were like, we don't care about these articles either. We just need to find a way to get these auditions out there so we can find the right actors for you know, our shows. Well, it turns out, since no one really wanted the articles, the magazine really didn't have much of a purpose on the internet because all, the, all their site was was the articles. So we had to go to the publisher and be like, look, guys, uh, you might want to rethink your entire model. You need to stop thinking about articles. You need to think about auditions. And we want you to create a, basically a, a SaaS platform where people can subscribe, submit their resumes, and get parts. Now, luckily, the founder, or the, rather the publisher of this publication, was really into like, you know, private equity. He just wanted to flip this business. So he listened to us. And six months after we did that research, we relaunched this whole thing, a brand new platform for auditions, and increased their revenue by 500% in the first three months. And that's thinking about user experience, the business impact of user experience. And my, my like pride in that, that, that um, project isn't just the success of obviously backstage getting money, but it was having the kind of chutzpah, if you will, to tell them to change their model, to come at it from here's what I know as a user experience person, let me tell you why you want to start with this. I could not have done that in my early days because I wouldn't have had, I don't think, the um, foundation, the, the tools at my, at my disposal to have that conversation. Because one of the things for me when it came to my voice in the world of user experience was after I learned about pro problem solving, the next thing I learned was how passionate I was about problem solving. And going to backstage in 2012 and saying, you know, you have to rethink your whole model doesn't really work when you're just doing it from a passionate standpoint. I had to come at it with like logic and reason and, and equipment models. But in, two, in 2000, I was, summer of 2000, I was 23, and I was working at a consulting company uh, as an information architecture, or, or information architect, uh, which we now call user experience designers. And I was very passionate about creating something that was going to work. And I got put on a uh, project for General Electric at this company. And GE was the number one client at this, this consulting company. And I was put on the most expensive project by GE at this company. By the way, again, 23 years old, there was no business that I had being running user experience on this, on this project. But here I was. The internet was young. Dotcom 1.0 was happening, and I was super passionate. And so, because I wanted to create such great experiences, I would kind of uh, push back, let's say, on our clients at GE, who were a little bit older, who I didn't have, probably didn't have the respect I probably should have had for them, um, or, or for the, their knowledge. And I would get into arguments with these people. And this one woman, who was very nice, her name was Kay, she came to me one day and she wanted to create a forum section on this kind of a financial learning website. And I was like, great, we can definitely create a forum section for you, no problem. And I like looked at this, this is an opportunity. I was like, this is my chance to design a forum that is gonna be better than all the forums that are out there. And Kay said to me, that's nice, Dan, but I just like this forum over here on this other website. It looks really nice, it's clean. Can we just use that, uh, that design or that, that uh, uh, aesthetic for, for our forums. And I was like, no, 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 I got this. And I went home for the weekend, and I spent all weekend designing this new forum system. Oh boy, it was amazing. And I came back on Monday and I said, Kay, look at this thing that I made for you. It's, it's gonna rock the world of forums in financial learning. And she said, no, no, I, I don't want that. I want the one I showed you. This is what I want. And I, I feel like, you know, I was pretty straightforward about that. Well, I was not gonna have that. And we got into it. And boy, did we start yelling in the middle of an open office where everyone around us stopped talking on the phone and having their meetings and could hear us yelling. My boss comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder. He's like, can I, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, all right. 
we walk outside of the deck of the office, and he says to me, what are you, what are you arguing about? What, what is this fight you're having? And I'm like, well, you know, she wants the forms this way. I think they should be this way. And he's like, is this, this the sword you're going to fall on? This is the thing? Like, are you prepared to get fired for this, this forum that ultimately doesn't matter? And I thought for a second, was I willing to sacrifice my career for these forums? And the obvious answer was no, I was not going to do that. But I had to think about it. And I thought about this like over the years, over the past like couple decades, I think about this fight I had and how passionate I was and how angry I was that we couldn't do things the way I wanted to. And I had to listen to the client because they were paying for this. And I learned something from that about like my own journey, which is that I had to find another way. I had to learn how to have that conversation and show that passion, but do it in a way that made more sense, that was more logical, that, that you know, not that I was ever gonna win that argument, but at least kind of try to be more persuasive than yelling. And what I thought, what I thought was really interesting about the, my boss who tapped me on the shoulder was he was a yeller himself. He would scream at our clients. He was also very intimidating, six foot, six foot five Viking looking guy who you know, could get away with it. He would hang up on clients, he would slam the phone down. Later on, he eventually became an employee of mine and he threw a table at me. So he, that was his voice, you know, <laughs> um, and not mine. And I, I was trying to like figure out, well, why does he get away with this and why don't I? And to this day, I really can't tell you. I think it's just part of like who he was and how he kind of showcased himself and I should not have mimicked that. So. I took away from it, like, I need to find another way of doing this. Now, having those soft skills is a really important part of user experience, but let's talk about the other sides of it too, right? So there's, I think there's a different reason that people get into product. Like, I got into it because I wanted to problem solve, you know? And, and by the way, I've never taken a design class in my life, and I should not be allowed to design anything because I, I am a terrible designer. But I kind of live in this world of, like, inter information architecture, interaction design, and usability. That's kind of my, that's kind of where, where I kind of live in my, my, my head. I know some great UX people who live in the visual design world. They live in like obsess over typography. I know friends of mine who are content strategists. They all kind of come at it from a different place. And I think that like a good designer or a good UX person, a good product person has a little bit of these things and probably has certain ones that kind of shine higher. And I think that's true of great designers too. Like my art director is not a great UX designer, but he can think about it a little bit. He's not a great developer, but he kind of knows how to talk to developers so that you know, we're all kind of sitting and swimming in the same language. Now, I, I give this as an example of kind of where we live in user experience because the, U, the world of user experience is actually quite broken. I mean, we don't know how to talk about ourselves. We don't know what to call ourselves. We don't even know what we, what we are. Are we product designers? Are we user experience designers? Are we UX, are we UI? What is the difference between UX and UI? Like no one really knows the answer to those questions and I don't think we have to answer them. I think it's about focusing on what we're good at and what we're trying to do, which again comes back to me thinking about problem solving. I mentioned that I'd never taken a, uh, a design class. That's technically not true. Um, I, uh, I took design classes when I was in college for theater. So I knew how to design sets, I knew how to design lighting, I knew how to design makeup, but I don't, I've never taken an actual graphic design class. But I think that when it comes to product and user experience, you don't have to have taken a design class. You know, I think a lot of the soft skills that people have to kind of learn come from way different uh, uh, topics than actual technology. You know, my, my background is theater and, and uh, uh, literature and journalism. And I think those all speak to storytelling. And I mentioned earlier that this is about storytelling, not about, you know, design per se. And my voice is coming, is coming from how does, that, how does that storytelling work and reflect itself in my daily life? And I'll give you an example of this. So I, uh, I think theater and product go hand in hand. I think that in good product, you have a designer, a developer, a project manager, a UX person, maybe a writer, and they all kind of have to be collaborating so that everything comes out the right way in the end. And theater's the same way. If you have a lighting designer who's not talking to the costume designer or the set designer, you might have someone on stage whose who's, uh, costume is totally washed out by light because there was no communication. So I, like, I, when I approach product, I think of it the same way that I, I would approach theater or, or a movie or whatever. You know, some, someone might approach it differently. So my friend Sid Harrell, 
Sid is a UX civics person. She's very much into like city engineering and whatnot. Very well-known person in the world of UX design. Her background is poetry. So fast in linguistics. And her kind of, I was talking to her about this. I interviewed a bunch of UX people for this talk to kind of see where, how they came about their language. And she said that, you know, poetry and the structure of, of words is kind of how her storytelling journey took place and how she kind of thinks about putting things together in, in cities and in designing cities, um, which I thought was kind of an interesting, uh, uh, I think, contextual, you know, uh, uh, story compared to mine. So well, this all comes down to, down to the idea of like we're building our voice over time, right? We're starting with, for me, it was problem solving, then it was passion, you know, applying these things and then borrowing from other people, right? And I like to look at like, what can I borrow from myself? So my background, like I said, is theater, musician. Um, I was not on the basketball team, but I certainly managed it like a nerd. Um, and I own bars. And all of these things were about creating experiences. And I'll, I'll tell you um, kind of a, a side note on, on the bar part of it. We were just talking about this earlier. I started opening bars in 2009. 2009. And this all goes back to my, my voice and storytelling. I wanted to see if I could apply all the stuff I do professionally and digital to the offline world. Can I do user research? Can I think about collaborating with a designer and, uh, and a developer, in this case, a construction person, to make something that solves a problem? And I went to a neighborhood, and I looked around this neighborhood in the East Village, and I was like, what kind of bar doesn't exist here? And I got an Irish pub over there. There's a sports bar there. There's a craft beer bar next door. I was like, I want to create something that's more like someone's living room, like someone you could hang out all day. And because and, in the East Village in New York, in New York you know, this, no one has a living room. The apartments are like the size of, you know, maybe half this room. And I, and I did that. And I actually went through the, the regular collaboration process I do with my team at, at Charming Robot with a developer, I mean, a construction worker, an actual designer. A, a, a bartender who helped me kind of craft cocktails, a chef to help me craft food, to really understand how this could all work together. And our Yelp reviews actually reflected this. Uh, I sold the bar in 2015, but our Yelp reviews, were, were, were many of them were, were like, hey, this is just like my living room. I love that I can come and hang out here all day. The bartender is my friend, you know? And that all kind of came together with us telling the story of, you have a living room that's outside of your apartment in New York, and this is a place that's friendly and calm and a place you can always kind of always enjoy your day. And this is why I think to myself that like all those skill sets that we have, they all come together, you know, and, and allow us to start telling stories, allow us to create great experiences. Wow, that is blurry. Um, and at the same time, I think the challenge is that, that because you can have such a wide variety of backgrounds to kind of come into this world of user experience, it also makes it very confusing for people to even know what we do. Uh, Jonathan Corman is another great UX person who has a very, very strong attitude, let's say. And uh, I really enjoy the fact that he was very straightforward to me about saying, no one knows what we do. My parents asked me what I do. I have to tell them I'm a designer because they have no clue what user experience means. Um, but as I was thinking through this, uh, I was thinking through that arg the argument I had with that one K, I started thinking like, what, how did I evolve this? When, when did like, when was the next point in my life that I kind of got a sense of what I actually do and why I might be good at it? And I realized that it was the, when I started to have empathy, when I started to look at like, oh, I'm not just solving this for a business, right? I'm not just trying to solve this problem because I want to. It's because I, I want to create something that actually solves a problem for people too. That actually gives them a reason, like I would go back to my, my, uh, my menus, that a reason for existing. And so around 2007, I had, I had some really good luck. Um, I had the fortune of, of creating or launching Hulu. At the same year, I redesigned CNN and the New York Times. And what I learned was that like, I was learning how to approach problems from a kind of human point of view. And so in 2007, when my friend Kevin and I finished working on Hulu, we left, we left this big agency we were working for, and we started our own agency called Hard Candy Shell. And boy, did we have a definitive voice as designers. And we were ultimately complete assholes. Uh, <laughs> we, the, 
our voice was just arrogance. And it wasn't arrogance from like a bad place. I mean, like, we didn't mean to be arrogant. We just looked at ourselves as the Gordon Ramsays of user experience design. <laughs> and we would yell and we would, but we would, but we'd come at it from a place of experience, right? This wasn't me at 23 yelling at, at, at you know, my client. This is me at 30 yelling at my client. So those seven years, big difference. But the reality was like, we, were, we weren't wrong, right? Like we, we, were, we, we launched from, you know, Hard Candy Shell, we launched Rent the Runway, we launched Foursquare, we launched Guilt. Like we had a great run of, of, of startups that we got to create. We, got, we redesigned the Wall Street Journal and helped them make money on a subscription basis, which no one was doing at the time. Like we, but we just did it with such attitude, you know? And, but, but at the same time, we wanted to have attitude. Like we wanted our voice to be a little bit edgy. We wanted to be able to push back on our clients and tell them no, because we had learned at big agencies that you, you're not allowed to say no, right? You, you say yes because there's more money coming in, but as a small agency, we can be a bit more, 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 more picky, right? So we did that. And on the one hand, we had some successes, which is great. On the other hand, what we noticed was it all, it all started to trickle down into our team members. So. You know, here we are, 30, 31 years old, feeling pretty good about ourselves. But when we have like a 23-year-old user experience designer who has, you know, been out in the world for a couple of years, now they have that arrogance too. Where did that, that come from? They didn't spend the past 10 years, you know, building up a resume of work, and yet they have the arrogance. And I, I remember sitting there like in my office being like, this is, this is not fun. Like, no, I don't like any of these people. And, it's not, and I don't like myself, you know what I mean? It got to the point where everyone was so arrogant and full of themselves that you couldn't have a brainstorm meeting because everyone was afraid that they, their, their idea would be shot down or laughed at. Not a great way to go, to go forward. Um, but it took me a few years to really kind of, I think, like really get this. Like, I mean, I say it started in 2007, but it was a little while before I really kind of looked internally and said, okay, Dan, like, you gotta figure out how to, how to do this better. And so while I did that, I kept, I kept thinking about storytelling and how, how can I use my craft as a storyteller, as a writer, as an actor, as a journalist, to, to be better at convincing people why they should do things. And I, it started in the arrogant world, but it evolved into being more about giving evidence, backing things up with, with quotes from users, like looking at the analytics and being smart about how you tell the story of analytics, which, which is funny because you don't think of analytics as particularly creative, but, but they do tell a story. I always say that the, you know, the analytics can tell you everything except for why. And then you go to do the research with the people and people give you the why. And combining those things are what kind of got me to be not just opinionated, but informed. And this is like where I started really getting to be, I think, a much more, much calmer, I think, a much more uh, approachable designer. And more importantly, I think a more solution-oriented designer or UX person. And this is why I say this is about not just your, your UX voice, voice, but your business voice. Finding solutions is really what it's all about. And pointing out when things are wrong is only helpful if you can give them a sense of what direction to go to make them right. And doing that with kind of a more, let's say a stronger attitude, one that is more positive, one that isn't insulting someone, or at least it's not telling them, to, or making them feel bad about themselves, or making them feel bad about their product, it's about making them feel hopeful, making them feel excited. And for me, it took, it took four years, it took 2007 to 2011, Four years of just feeling arrogant. And I remember I was, uh, I was out for drinks with a friend of mine who was a um, creative director in 2000, I think it was 2010. And we're having drinks and he worked in an agency that I, I had previously been at. And I had no respect for that agency. And the reason I had no respect for it was because I just thought the work they were doing was kind of boring. Uh, it was kind of uh, trendy. It was like chasing trends and not really thinking creatively about things, but just kind of doing what everyone else is doing. And, and I just think it was kind of uninspired. And I told him this, and probably not the best way, 
basically. I said, I said, you should quit your job. You should leave it. You're doing terrible work there. You're better than this. Well, we didn't talk for six, <coughs> we didn't talk for six months. And the reason we didn't talk for six months is I didn't realize how, offended, how much I'd offended him. Well, that guy and I eventually made up. And in 2011, after four years at Hard Candy Shell, I couldn't deal with it anymore. I was done. I was sick of the attitude. I was sick of the arrogance. I was sick of all, like, just, just the, the negativity that surrounded everyone every day. And so I said to this guy who had quit that agency at that time, I was like, let's, let's start another company. Let's, let's do this better. Than I, than, than, and, and I apologized to him, obviously, for, for being so arrogant. And he's like, all right. And we started Charming Robot, and I left Hard Candy Shell. Sold my, sold my shares to my partner and was like, good luck. I hope, you know, I hope you succeed. But when we started Charming Robot, I was like, I don't want to come at things so negatively. I want to be solution oriented. I want to be empathetic. And it changed my, not just my whole like company and my whole business, but it also changed my, my life. Like I became a happier person by being a more solution oriented person. Finding out that, oh, I can be I can be helpful and, and, and I can be nice and friendly and, and actually, you know, and what happened was at Hard Candy Shell, we never really, didn't really have repeat customers, which is crazy because we had very many successes, but we ne no one ever came back. And oftentimes, if they did come back, we said no to them because we were like, we already, did, we already did you right. Like, you, don't, you don't need us anymore. And I told my robot, I was like, wow, like what? that's a terrible business model. Like you need to have people come back because <laughs> they'll, they'll, kind of, they'll be loyal to you if you help them again and again and again. So I mentioned that Backstage story earlier. So the guy John, who was the publisher of Backstage, he then left and went to Billboard. And at Billboard, we had a different problem, but we, we tackled it, solved that problem for Billboard and for the Hollywood Reporter. And then he came back to me again when he went and bought another media company called Modern Luxury. We, over COVID, when uh, no one was doing anything, we changed their business um, to the digital side. They had done no digital almost their whole existence. We revamped it. Came back to us again in 2022 to when he bought a company called Clipper, which is like a local coupon company. And this guy's come back to us five times over the years because we don't just help him, we, we, we legitimately partner with him. And that was a, that was a change of pace for me. Um, but I realized that as I've gotten older and then as I've kind of evolved and developed my voice, it's because my way of thinking has changed. And I can't let myself kind of sit there and kind of just be the person I was at 23 or at 30 or at 40. And how I do that and how any of us do that is really about listening to other people. It's really about taking and borrowing the things that we see from people that that are, um, that are inspiring to us. And then I think it's about being honest. And I think oftentimes the honesty is about t telling people things that they don't want to hear. It's just telling them things they don't want to hear in a better way, right? Telling someone that their website is garbage may not, may not, be, be, may not be the best approach, but you can con convey to them that it's garbage by telling them, here's how you can make it better. Um, and I think the other thing is understand why we're making choices. Like when I was at that big agency in 2000 and I was at the other one in 2006, we were not allowed to ask why. Why are we doing this? Why are we making these choices? As much as uh, the arrogance of Hulu did, did, uh, did uh, attack me, the best thing I learned from that, that project was when I sat in front of Jason Kalar, who became the CEO, and he was looking at this stack of like 180 wireframes that we had worked on for six months for Hulu. By the way, they were garbage. I mean, they were, were some of the worst things we've ever, I've ever put on paper. And they all came from bad ideas because no one was allowed to ask why. In fact, when, when the TV executives had these ideas for uh, different features on Hulu that we knew were gonna be failures, we would try to push back and our boss would be like, no, 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 they're gonna pay us more for them, so just, just do them. So Jason Kilar sat there with a stack of bad ideas that were turned into worse ideas that were six months worth of work. And he said to us, how did, how did we get here? And we told him in a very arrogant, <laughs> uh, probably tirade way. But he said, you know what? Let's throw it all out. Let's toss it in the garbage and let's start over. 
And we did. We started over and we designed what became the first three years of features in Hulu. We designed it all in six weeks, um, July to August 2007. And that question he asked us, which we should have been asking him, right? That changed our, my whole approach of like, I can always ask why. It's not about saying yes or no, it's why are we doing this? Why are we doing this now? Why shouldn't we do this later? And then I kind of layer that in with, what are the different ways that, that I can like approach things, like not being a yelling person like my former boss, but I had another boss who was really empathetic at, at one point. He was, he was very uh, calm and would sit you down and be like, all right, you know, it looks like you're having trouble with this. Let's see if we can push through this together. And he was very collaborative. And I realized like that his collaborative nature was more in line with the way I approach things. And so I really appreciated that. And then I had another boss who I took some other things from. And then I like would listen to someone else. And I took a little bit of that arrogance, you know, with me. I still have a little bit of it, but I temper it with other things. And and then I listened to my other friends who are in the world of UX. My friend Steve, he's a brilliant probably the most calm UX person I've ever met. Every time I talk to him, I feel like I'm being like, you know, kind of rocked in a cradle. He's like just so, but he's so approachable and he's so nice. And I, I don't think he's ever said, I don't think he's even ever sworn in front of me. Like he's just a really good guy who I've learned from as well. And I've stolen some of his stuff. And that, I guess that's what it comes down to in the end is that like our voice is never gonna be done, you know? We're gonna have phases in it. We're gonna change it, we're gonna evolve it. And it's cause we're always gonna be learning. And that's the most important thing in anything in product is never stop learning. And I think I worry about this all the time. I don't know about you guys. Like I'm 46 years old. I am worried about becoming a dinosaur in technology because of everything that changes so fast, right? Now, you know, whether you're into web three or into AI or you're still working on regular e-commerce or whatever, or content, like everything is always evolving. And if we're not evolving with it, we're gonna get lost. Or we'll be arrogant and that arrogance won't be, won't be merited, which you shouldn't be arrogant anyways. But we always have to be learning because if we're not, we're gonna get caught behind and we're not gonna have anything to say. And we don't have any sort of voice at all. And so I'm gonna leave it at that, but any questions? Yes. Have you learned how to about not you know, no one's ever asked me. Um, but I think that, that, you know, I think that what people assume is, at this point in my career, it's I have a resume of things I've worked on that people have heard of, so they're like, oh, I wanna hire you for that. I think the, I think the problem is actually, it's, it's different. The problem is they think that I do everything. So they're like, Dan, I wanna hire you for this project. I'm like, right, but you, need, you actually need like, this group of people that I've been working with for 15, 20 years who kind of back me up and help me and whatever. And they're like, well, but you did this. I'm like, no, no, no. I did not do that alone. And, and that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think there's like, I talk a lot about this when it comes to UX, like education wise. I, I don't think there's a right combination of education. I, I mean, there are things that I prefer. Like, I want to hire people who have humanities backgrounds, right? Like, I think that's really important because it kind of helps you shape things into something that makes sense. But I also don't think you have to go to college, you know what I mean? Like, I think that. I think that any good person in user experience, any good person in design, any good person in development should have a little bit of knowledge of all of those things so that you understand what's being built and what can't be built and what can be. And so I don't know that anyone's ever uh, questioned my background, but you know what I'll question that was, I question people who take UX courses. I don't wanna hire them. I will not hire them. I've been burned by those people. And I say that as someone who created the first set of UX curriculum about 10, 11 years ago with my friend Sarah, and I walked away from it because I was like, this is not something that should be taught in, in the schools. No one should pay for this. It's should be something you learn on a job after you get, get, your, get your degree or learn, learn from something else. So, yeah. This doesn't count, right? No. <laughs> Take everything away from this. <laughs> yeah. Um, you and I have very similar backgrounds. I, I started in theater and went back to college for theater. And I'm literally like about 16 years 
down the road from you. The only difference is that you're created an agency and uh, a serial entrepreneur that you are, which is a good thing. I see that as you see possibilities and why they're not happening. But I am finding being an outdoor QX designer right now looking for jobs. A lot of times they keep asking, okay, where did you get your education? Where did you get your experience? And when I don't have the degree, how do you, how do you answer that when they ask you, where did you learn what you did? Why don't you have a degree? Why don't you do this? You know, certifications, et cetera. I mean, the first thing I would say is that I tell people I just started doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I didn't even know what I was doing. I say to people like, when I started my company in 1995, 96, whatever it was, like I didn't know I was creating, doing user experience and information architecture. And when I got my first job as an IA in 1999, I didn't, I didn't actually like it. So I tell people like, you know, I, I kind of found my way into this world by, by realizing what I wasn't good at and realizing what I was, was good at. Like I'm not a good designer. I thought I was gonna be a designer and I was like terrible at it. But I tell people that like, I learned this stuff by talking to people, by researching, like like seeing what else is out there, by um, looking to people who are, who are my senior. And once I got rid of my arrogance and like actually started seeing that people, what other people brought to the table, and then I and then I just say, look, here's an ex here are the examples of things that I've made that show that I can know what I'm doing. And the last thing I tell people is that I'm always learning, right? I'm always t keeping abreast of what's going on because what I made last year or ten years ago doesn't have any relevance to what I'm working on today. And I would tell someone that who is 22, you know, I'd be like, if you're, you're just out of school, if you took that UX course for some reason, and like, you feel like you got something out of it, it's like, what did you really learn? Because if you're a developer, right? I have a guy I'm working with, he's just out of college. He's a developer, he's a front end developer. He's working with my, my CTO right now. And I listen to them talk. And this kid, super smart. He doesn't know anything about development even though he's a degree in engineering, computer science, because he hasn't done anything. So I think, I think it's about telling people what you've done, showing that you know what you're talking about, showing that you've evolved from the first thing you did to what you did last year, and that, that you're looking to do something new and exciting. And the education doesn't matter, I don't think. I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> no, that, that, that does. It, it, it comes down to storytelling. It's obviously yeah. the theater thing, figure out the story. Yeah. You know, Getting them to actions because um, lately I've been working a lot with um, development teams that are both onshore and offshore. Mm -hmm. And particularly the offshore people, or mm -hmm. they come from offshore, but, and I'll, I'll qualify that with they're from India. And they really put a ton of value on getting that education, getting that degree, showing that certification. Right. Prove to me that you know what you're talking about. And I'm like, let me show you my body of work. Let right. me speak to that. And then after a while, then they do it. But getting, getting that little toe in the door to let them listen to the story is, is the not part of that crap. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, it's, a, it's funny is that like, I'm so anti-certification when it comes to UX. Like, I like I definitely like rally against it in a lot of ways. And I, I think that when and this is this is true. I've worked with a lot of people in India as well. Like, I think there's a rigidness about that the, the, those, that style of working that actually makes it harder to be creative when it comes to good UX and good storytelling, um, which is problematic. I mean, I'm not going to say that you can't be a great UX person in India. I mean, you can be, but like, I, I just think you don't get as much originality and innovation um, and you, you know, and I, I think in certification, I see, I see this with people who take UX classes, they are taught to do something a certain way and then are often told you can't do it these other ways, but there's no can't, right? There's, there's no, there's just, is it okay for this solution or is it not okay for this solution? And when you're, when you're so rigid and you're certified, you, you kind of, you lose the forest to the trees, if that makes sense. Of course. Yeah. How do you approach user experiences for products that have widely valued uh, target personas? Is it maybe a lowest common denominator or something more? I start with probably the lowest common denominator. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when you're building a startup, for example, 
you always focus on like the bottom of the funnel. Like where, like where, who, it might not be the biggest audience to start, but where, where am I gonna get the most bang for my buck? When looking at a wide, like a bigger organization, like if I'm doing something for like the New York Times, for example, a huge audience, right? I try to think about what are the most relevant use cases for the different audiences and where am I gonna get the most bang for my buck? Where am I gonna like create things that are gonna get those audiences interested? Um, I think that you get much less interesting design solutions with those kind of things, but that's okay because you're going after a mass audience. Um, the other thing I think about is I don't like personas. I think personas are uh, an overused um, uh, trope. I prefer thinking about things in terms of behaviors. So when I think about it that way, I don't think about there are 20,000 different personas. There's what is the intention of someone when they come in here? And I think like travel is a good example. If you're working on a travel website, you have a person who is a planner, like a long-term planner. You have a business traveler. You have a, someone who's looking for the cheapest flight. You have whatever. And all the, those can all be the same people, just with different intentions. And so when I think about it that way, it's a little bit easier to approach um, design. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of related to this, I don't what you're going to say, but what do you think about they kind of started to create some automated bots where they create basically personas and they, they can talk to each other and they make these back, you know, back stories, but they're just AI, but they're actually using this for UX market studies. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think of that? I think it's garbage. <laughs> uh, I mean, I remember in, years ago, before, when I was working in, uh, at an advertising agency, and I'm also not good at marketing, so. Um, but I, was, I remember we were sitting there and we were doing like a brand day for uh, a Scotch brand, and we were making personas and we were telling the story, okay, this is Peter, and Peter is 41 years old, and he works on Wall Street, and he does it. I'm like, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> this person does not exist. And I, I think when you're trying to make, I think when you're making up personas, and I, this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I think when you're making up personas, you're kind of designing them to your will as opposed to what people actually want. And so yeah. that's why I love going out and doing research without any sort of thesis. It's just like, I want to hear what people say and what they, watch what they do and, and kind of start designing from that versus let me get an idea of this person in my head, you know. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, like, when we, when we designed Rent the Runway, we thought we knew who we were designing it for. We thought it was for, you know, sorority girls uh, who are going, you know, to, uh, to things that, you know, at their sorority events, whatever. We were totally wrong. It was not, it was, could not have been more far off. The biggest audience that we've, we learned later was military housewives because they had more events to go to than, than sorority people did. And so I think if we had thought that way from the beginning, we probably would have approached design wrong because we, we would have been thinking about a very different person, which would have destroyed the brand equity that we built up. So, you know, I, I, that's why I think making up personas is just not particularly yeah, useful. Yeah. Yeah, that all goes back to behaviors. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. Yes? So how do you go about finding those people to do the research? With? Good question. Um, I use a recruiter. Uh, there's a, a couple of recruiters that are pretty good nationwide. And generally I know, and this is gonna sound somewhat hypocritical, but I know the kind of people I wanna talk to, at least for, like if I'm doing like I just did a project in crypto, so I wanted to talk to people who understood Web3, who have, were holding on to like, some sort of cryptocurrency or NFTs. So like, that helped me narrow a little bit of who I wanted to talk to. But generally, I work with the recruiter. We create a screener to kind of you know, figure, figure out who, how we get down to that, whittle them down to the right people, and then we go talk to them in person. I will say for that research, though, we usually only do, only do like anywhere between 12 and 24 interviews. I think after about 15, you're kind of done. and um, the uh, the one on one in person or two on one, one like two people one one note taker one interviewer and one person, and I don't do any focus groups. I hate focus groups. I think that they're just a, another bad way of getting you know having damaged data because you have a a herd mentality where someone starts following someone else, and the one way mirror thing is just the worst. Like everyone knows someone's back there, and I'll tell you the story. This is I think this is really funny. Um, why I hate focus groups. So. This is years ago, I was working for Newsday, which is like a local Long Island newspaper. And we were doing focus groups to test out some ideas of, of digital products they wanted to launch. And I will say, for the most part, these focus groups were actually pretty good. We had some great recruits, a lot of parents, whatever. And we got through three focus groups. And it was very clear, two things were very clear. One is that 
the products that this company wanted to launch, no one wanted. Like, not a single person wanted any of these things at all. But the other thing that was clear was everyone wanted something. It was one thing that was very clear, like the product that this company should make. It was like so clear. It was like, like, why wouldn't you make this, right? So we're in the middle of the last focus group, and my friend Kevin and I are moderating it, and we have our laptop open, and we get a message from our client who's behind the mirror. And just in all caps, it says, get back here right now. We're like in the middle of like a conversation. We're like, okay, guys. Um, have some M&Ms, we'll be right back. And we get into the back room, and our client is furious. And I, like, I picture this, and I don't know if this is exactly true, but like, her entire team like, seemed like they were cowering in the back, and she's like, in the, like, sitting at the doorway, just like smoke coming out of her ears. And, and she was like, this is a disaster. What are we gonna do? And we're like, it's pretty obvious what we're gonna do. We're not gonna make these things, and we're gonna make this thing. And she's like, no, 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 we have to do these things. I, I'm, I'm, they're in my roadmap, and I was like, but you can change your roadmap. <laughs> like, there's an obvious product to be made here. Um, and she just didn't listen. She didn't listen to them, and she, she eventually um, got fired. But uh, I think the lesson for me was that, like, you know, we have to be adaptive. We have to be listening, and we can't, we can't put our own ideas onto our users. Um, that was a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's great. Cool. Oh, wait, one second. I'll come, back, I'll come right back to you. I just want to get to you. Uh, for some reason, those things always go together, too. Um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you, I think the best way of doing that is having a really, really good project manager. Um, I am not, I'm, thinking a lot of, I'm, not, I'm, not a lot of, I'm not good at a lot of things, apparently. I'm not a great project manager. But I do think that being willing, you need to be able to say no, or you need to be able to say no but, or you know what I mean? And, and I always like to, to um, use money as a, a way to get people to stop and expanding the scope and the, the timeline. Like, it's like, okay, yes, you can do that, but it's gonna cost you another $10,000 and it's gonna add to the timeline. Oh, I want it to take less time. Okay, well, then what are we, gonna, what are we losing? What are we taking out of the project? And I think it's hard doing that the first time and sometimes people will walk away and clients will be like, oh, too bad, someone else will do it. And I always tell people, like, look, you can go, if someone else told you they can do this faster and for less money, go for it, go for it. I guarantee you, you'll be back here in six months. And I would say that's probably correct 70% of the time. Um, but it's really, it's really hard. It's just about pushing back and being very firm. That's, that's the only way to do it. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, um, it's more a matter of um, trying to tell them, you know, Brandon, uh, you are not the people. You may want to design the people, but you are not your people. Yes, yeah, I have a... I'm a design for the user to support the business. Yeah. If you let me figure out what the user wants, then I'll fit your goals to get them. I have a slide in my kickoff deck for every client that says, you are not the user. I say, you might be a user, right? I might be a user, but I'm not the user. And so one of the rules I have, and I tell clients to keep me honest in this too, I say none of us should be saying to each other, well, this is what I do, or when I'm on my phone, I do this, or on my computer, I do this. And I say, if you hear me say that, or any member of my team say that, call us out on it, and we're gonna call you out on it too. And boy, you know, the first couple times you do that, they, they learn pretty fast. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your time.